Hi, everyone, and welcome back for part two of chapter one, an introduction to cognitive psychology. Um, for the rest of this lecture, we're going to talk about not necessarily uh, what's what's going to be important is not necessarily the content of what we're talking about. It is important and you, and you should know it and learn it. Um, but we're going to focus on this content in, in upcoming chapters in more detail. Um, but right now we're going to use a little bit of content and a little bit of information about cognitive psychology to sort of break down the way that we do cognitive psychology, the way that we conceptualize cognitive psychology in a modern sense. Uh, and then we're going to transition and talk about uh, some of the methods we use in cognitive psychology. So we're up to the point of what we might call the cognitive revolution. Uh, we've seen the beginnings of psychology and cognitive psychology. We saw the takeover of behaviorism. And then we some start we started to see some um, some chinks in the armor of behaviorism. We saw uh, some experiments from Tolman, um, some arguments from Chomsky that really started showing everyone uh, in the sort of mid uh, 20th century that behaviorism uh, needed um, to be changed, that behaviorism should not be the only dominant force in psychology. We really do need to study the mind. Um, and so we're left at this place where in order to understand these cognitive, uh, complex cognitive behaviors, we need to measure and quantify scientifically uh, in a reductionistic way, observable behavior. Uh, this is the big contribution of behaviorism. Um, they did a great job of uh, teaching us how to do this. And then we can use that behavior to make inferences about underlying cognitive activities. And this allows us to consider how these behaviors uh, tell us things about the way the mind works. So the first really big movement um, in the cognitive revolution is what's known as information processing. And we'll see lots of what we call information processing models um, in cognitive psychology. And so this shifts um, from the behavioral behaviorist stimulus response view of the of human behavior. And it says, well, let's break down the way that humans process information, right? That's what the brain does. Uh, it's an information processor. And then it spits out behavioral outcomes um, to, to best deal with the what it thinks is out there in the world based upon the information that it has been given. And the best analogy is to a digital computer. Um, in the same way that we can break down the function, functioning of a computer into its pieces and parts, right? We have the, the operating system and the sort of physical nature of the screen and, and, the, and the keys and the keyboard and the mouse and the trackpad. Uh, but then we can break down the processes. Uh, you have RAM in a computer, which is basically how much stuff your computer can handle doing at one time. Um, the more RAM you have, you know, the more um, the more programs you can have open, the more things you can be streaming um, all at once, right? Your your computer can process more information. Your computer then has to have a memory, right? That's your hard drive where it stores information for later use. Your your computer doesn't necessarily need everything it stores at all times. It needs to be able to go in and pull out that information as needed. Uh, and so we can think about using this sort of processing of information as an analogy to the mind. And, and that's what this movement in, psych in cognitive psychology did. Um, one of the first places that this occurred is in the study of attention. Uh, Cherry in 1953 and Broadbent in 1958 um, did some um, sort of seminal experiments on um, how people attend to different messages, particularly uh, how people choose or um, or choose which messages or pieces of information to attend to and which ones not to attend to. So Cherry in 1953 um, was interested in auditory attention. He created like a, a big headset, uh, headphones, where he could present one message, message A, 
in someone's left ear, and then another message, message, message B in the right ear. Um, and he would ask them to pay attention to either the, their left ear or their right ear, maybe follow along. Um, so in the in the left ear, you might be hearing uh, someone read a passage from a book. And in the right ear, um, you might be hearing someone tell a story about their day that they had yesterday. And what Cherry found is that even if you tell people um, that they need to attend to message B, they can still report some of the details from message A, meaning our attention is not perfect, that we're supposed to be attending to message B in our right ear, but some of the information from message A is leaking in, right? It's coming in and we're still processing it. And then Broadbent sort of built upon this uh, and developed a, a theory, and, and we're gonna see that theory in the form of a flow diagram for what's occurring when someone attends to information. So at the top here of this flow diagram, we see um, a diagram of how information would flow through an early computer. We have some kind of input, we have a processor that processes that input, it gets stored in a memory unit so that the computer can, can have that information and have access to it. And then it moves on to um, an arithmetic unit or uh, something that's gonna maybe do some calculations with this information that's been stored in memory. And then the computer gives you an output. So you can even think of this as being maybe a, a, a calculator, right? You tell it 10 times 10, the, the calculator processes, okay, that's a 10 multiplied by 10. It moves it into memory, right? Okay, let's store. Okay, the question is 10 times 10. Now let's do the math, 10 times 10. And now let's produce the output 100. Well, Broadbent said, well, we can sort of use this as an analogy for the way that attention works. We have all of this input coming from the world. We have four arrows, and this kind of represents the, the deluge of information that's bombarding your senses all at one time. And attention acts as a filter. That's, the, that's really what attention does. It filters out the unnecessary information and narrows it down to just the stuff that matters or just the stuff that we're trying to attend to. And then it shifts that information to what's known as a detector. So um, imagine you're looking at a Where's Waldo book, right? a page on, in a Where's Waldo book. Your senses are bombarded with information, right? Where, Where's Waldo books are intentionally made to bombard your visual sense. You're enacting this filter. Um, if you're looking for where's if you're looking for Waldo in a Where's Waldo book, what should you be looking for? Oh, he's got black glasses. He's got um, he wears a hat and a shirt that are sh uh, red and white stripes. I think he's got blue pants on, if I'm not mistaken. Typically, on uh, the sort of classic Waldo. Um, so that's your filter, and so you're only passing through information that's a hat, uh, black glasses, red and white stripes, right? You're you're bombarded with information, you're filtering out the stuff that doesn't matter, and then you're you're sending along a smaller amount of information. And then the quote unquote detector processes that information and says, um, ooh, that's red and white stripes, but they're too thin to be Waldo. Waldo stripes are usually a little thicker. Or, oh, yep, yeah, that's a person with glasses and a hat, but their hat is orange, so that's not Waldo, right? The detector, is then looking at this information and trying to detect uh, if it has the elements that we want it to have. And then if it does, then the detector can send that relevant information on to memory, maybe for further processing, um, so that then you can decide whether something is Waldo or not. So this uh, basic structure of thinking about brain processing in a similar way to the, how we think about a computer processing information was a big step forward for cognitive psychology. And again, what we call information processing, because now we're really thinking about what does the mind do and what are the different elements of the mind? We have 
we have this process of a filter. We have another process of a detector. And then we have another process of memory. We have over here, if we keep going, we have another process of decision making. Um, and so this was a revolutionary step to, to really open the doors to and open our eyes to everything that the mind is potentially doing. So <clears throat> here we see a timeline of the cognitive revolution, this sort of paradigm shift um, in what we now consider cognitive psychology. We sort of start with Tolman right back in the 30s and the 40s. Uh, we see a bunch of stuff happening in the 50s. Uh, we have Cherry's attentional experiments. We see the emergence of computers. Um, we see the first conferences about um, the beginnings of cognitive psychology, where we're bringing together um, um, people that are working on information processing in computers and people who are working on information processing in humans. We get the introduction of these flow diagrams from Broadbent. And then we fast forward a few years and we get the first textbook of cognitive psychology by Ulrich Neisser uh, in 1967. I actually know uh, Ulrich's son, who's uh, not a cognitive psychologist, but he is a philosopher, a uh, great guy. Um, and so this transition really from the 40s through the 50s to the 60s uh, is what we like to call the cognitive revolution. Um, leading to the development of information processing approaches to cognitive psychology. Uh, you know, we consider artificial intelligence to be something very, very modern, but people were thinking about this a long time ago. Um, and in fact, um, computer science and human psychology and cognitive psychology are intric intricately linked um, in their histories together uh, in a very uh, reciprocal way. Um, you know, we, we use the computer often as an analogy of the brain or, and the mind. It's not a perfect analogy. Uh, your brain is not a computer, um, but it, it helps sometimes to think about it that way. Um, and then we also try and backwards design computers to do the things that humans can do. And we often find that we can get them to do it better than humans can do. Obviously, your calculator uh, is better than you are at doing calculations. Um, a Tesla um, is better than you at driving and being safe, right? Because we have built artificial uh, intelligence machines that can do those things better than a human can. And so our original definition really of artificial intelligence um, in, in academia is 1955 by McCarthy. He said, making a machine uh, artificial intelligence is making a machine behave in ways that would be called intelligent if a human were doing it. So if I showed you two processes and I told you that both of these are a human and you go, yep, both of these, it looks like an intelligent activity, uh, producing an intelligent outcome and solving a problem. Uh, and then I told you, oh, actually one of these is a computer. Um, then I've created artificial intelligence because you couldn't tell the difference uh, between the computer and the human. Uh, that's actually a, um, a really famous um, uh, competition in artificial intelligence um, to try and uh, produce a program um, that people are unable to tell the difference between the computer and a human. Okay, um, next we move on into the 60s a little further and we see uh, these information processing models start to make their way into other areas of psychology. Uh, in this case, memory uh, by, uh, I'm sorry, that should be a K, there should be a T in there instead of an R, it should be Atkinson and Schifrin, 1968. They developed a three-stage model of memory, uh, sensory memory, short-term memory, long-term memory, uh, for helping explain the way that memory functions, just like Broadbent um, helped explain the way that attention functions. Uh, and then um, maybe the most famous memory researcher of all time, Indel Tolving in the 70s and the 80s, um, sort of took this model and advanced it even further. So let's, let's take a look at what they did 
uh, using these process information processing models. Atkinson and Schifrin, oh, we got the T right there, uh, said that, okay, we have all this input, right, from, uh, and really what they're talking about here is input from attention. So we could almost, if you think about the left, uh, be, the left side of this beyond input, we could put the broadbent model of attention. Uh, and then attention is maybe sending information to sensory memory, or we could think of attention as, as helping pare down as being a sort of a part of this sensory memory. Anyway, uh, information comes into the senses and you hold it in sensory memory uh, for a very short period of time. Some of that information makes its way to short-term memory uh, where we can hold information in our mind and think about it. So if I told you to remember these numbers uh, and try and remember them for as long as possible, six, four, nine, one, two, six, seven, three, 10, right? and, and you're repeating those numbers back to yourself, that's happening in this place we call short-term memory. And then short-term memory has a relationship with long-term memory, which is where you store information long-term. So if I asked you right now, I want you to remember um, <clears throat> the, um, the first time, I want you to try and remember your first day of high school. Right? I want you to try and remember your first day of high school, or maybe um, the earliest memory you have from high school. Well, when you recall that memory, right, all of you take a second, close your eyes, think about your first day of high school. What, what was it like? What were you wearing? Who did you meet? All that stuff is sitting in long-term memory. It's there, right? It's back in the, in the mind somewhere. And when I prompt you with it, you recall that memory. That's the green arrow here. You recall that memory and move it to short-term memory where you can play with it. You can see it, you can feel it, you can smell it, you can think about it, you can examine it, right? It's in your conscious mind. That's kind of what we think about short-term memory as, the conscious mind. And I could ask you questions. I could say, uh, did you have a good day or a bad day? And you can use that information to provide an output, to provide answers to my questions. So this is another process model, just like Broadbent's attentional process model. Uh, but then we can also have a conceptual model, which is what we see here, this diagram by Tolving. And Tolving said, yes, th this process is basically correct, but the long-term memory box is more complicated than this. It's not just one box of long-term memory. We can conceptually break up long-term memory into episodic memories. These are memories about your life, such as your first day of high school. Long-term memory is also semantic information, facts. So who is the first president of the United States? George Washington. Um, you don't have a life memory of George Washington. You were not alive then, but you know the fact that he was the first president of the United States. And then we have what are known as procedural memories, uh, memories for how to do physical actions like riding a bike. Remember how um, everyone says you never forget how to ride a bike? Well, you have your procedural long-term memory to thank for that. Um, so what Tolving did is what a lot of, what, I'm sorry, what Atkinson and Schifrin combined with Tolving, what they've done here is use this information processing um, style of cognitive psychology to take a very basic and fundamental cognitive process, which is memory, and break it down into its pieces, its parts, its um, uh, its independent and, and related processes, as well as elaborate on it uh, conceptually um, and what it is. So this is the type of thing that cognitive psychologists like to do. You take a, an area of um, psychology, like memory or attention or perception or language, and we start to map it out. We start to try and break it down and figure out um, what it is, 
um, how it functions, uh, and then sometimes why it functions that way. Um, okay, so we can also talk about, and here we're gonna get into some of our methods. I wanna introduce um, really quickly the physiology of cognition before we get into um, some methods, uh, because in today's day and age, we do actually have the ability to observe, in a sense, the mind, because we can observe the brain and its functioning and, and its impact on functioning. Um, so some of the earliest examples of this were early neuropsychologists or neuroscientists who would study the brains and behavior of people with brain damage. Um, so someone has a concussive blow to the head or has to have brain surgery uh, or is in an accident and it damages their brain, we can look and see how that changed their behavior and their cogn cognitions. Um, with the advent of um, more complicated technologies, we could use electrophysiology to look at the electrical responses of the nervous system, including the brain. Um, as we'll learn in chapter two, um, the brain functions essentially on electricity and we can measure that electricity and, and try and draw conclusions about the functioning of the mind. And then in really modern times, uh, we actually have the ability to image the brain, to see the brain uh, using a few different methodologies, which we'll talk about later. So when cognitive psychology began, it was really stuck in this information processing model where all we could do was look uh, at behavior and then build these information processors for how uh, the mind works. But now with the advent of uh, really modern medical technology, we can co-opt that medical technology and study the brain itself and then connect that to uh, cognitions and really learn a lot more uh, about cognitive psychology. Okay, so really quickly, to end this chapter, we're gonna talk about some of the basic things and methods that cognitive psychologists use. Uh, this is not meant to be an exhaustive um, account or list of methodologies. We're gonna, we're gonna slowly build our repertoire of methodologies across the semester. But for right now, we need to, to have some sort of framework for thinking about these methodologies. The most basic way we can sort of break them down uh, is into three categories. We have action-based experiments, response-based experiments, and then case studies. So we're gonna look at these each in turn. Uh, action-based experiments um, are things that, are, are things like um, reaction time and, and accuracy. So um, in this experiment in 2004, uh, Davenport and Potter were interested in how um, people um, process information from scenes and the context of those scenes versus the sort of figure of the scene. So in the example A, we have two scenes, a football game and then a church in which we, eat, we have each a central figure, right? A football player in the context of a football game and then a, a priest in the context of a church. And the figure and the context are congruent. They go together. In B, we have switched the priest and the football player such that the figure is not congruent, is incongruous with the context. And then of course, you could also show people a context or without a figure or a figure without a context. And they were just interested in knowing how people process these different types of information. How do people connect a figure to its background, its appropriate context? And so they used people's decision-making reaction time and their accuracies to study that, right? So the, the, the key here is that people have to perform an action. They have to press a button, they have to do something. Uh, and then we're going to observe that behavior uh, and make draw a conclusion about the functioning of the mind. So we've sort of seen that already uh, in some of our early experiments. Uh, in response-based experiments, we ask people 
to do a couple different things. Uh, we can ask them to just watch something and see what happens. Uh, and that's the case here. I actually don't know if it's going to let me play this. Sorry, guys. I'm going to pop out and play the video here. Um, we ask people to maybe observe stimuli, and then we just measure their responses, um, their natural responses. One of those being eye tracking, um, which is where we, let me pop down here, using um, some this sort of complex system of cameras, we can actually record where people's pupils are falling on a screen. And even now, uh, now in the last few years, we have what are called ambulatory eye trackers, where you just wear them and walk around in the world and we can see what people are looking at out in the world. And so they kind of look like this. What we're gonna see here is a video of, I believe a commercial. And we're gonna see all these little dots on the screen and those dots are just naturally where people look um, as they're watching this commercial. I hate Mondays. Yeah, they're the worst. No worries, man. Everything will be all right. <laughs> yeah, man. Oh, don't fret me, brother. The sticky bun comes soon. Yeah. Wicked coffee, Mr. Jim. Julia, turn the frown the other way around. Hey, Dave, you're from Minnesota, right? Yes, I. The land of 10,000 lakes. The Gopher State. So in conclusion, things are pretty dismal. You know what this room needs? A smile. Who wanna come with I? Traveling along, <laughs> there's a song that we're singing. Come on, get happy. You guys are three minutes late. Don't be no cloud on a sunny day. Yeah, chill, Winston. Sir? Respect, boss man. <laughs> okay, so we can see uh, from all these little dots that there are particular patterns about where people look and when they look. And so perhaps we can understand why people look at certain parts of a scene. Most of people's attention goes to faces um, and particularly faces from people who are talking, right? This makes perfect sense, um, but that's not necessarily a foregone conclusion, right? We need to do this experiment with eye tracking in order to, to see that. Uh, and these are just people's natural responses to a stimulus that we're studying. Um, another form of response-based data collection, something you might be a little more intuitively familiar with, are just like surveys or questionnaires or little tasks that we give people that require responses, like an IQ test um, or a, a list of words that need to be remembered. And then we see how many people, how many words people can remember. So these all fall under response-based data collection. And lastly, um, we can do case studies, which is where we take uh, particularly um, maybe disruptive uh, circumstances, often damage or trauma to the brain uh, caused by um, strokes or surgeries or things like that or accidents. And we see what we can learn um, about the functioning of the brain and the mind from, uh, from those incidents. So there's a couple famous examples. Oh, let me get my laser pointer back. A couple famous examples. Um, um, patients named Paul Broca and Carl Wernicke um, helped us uh, understand uh, lots of things about language after they had had some damage to the language areas of their brain. Um, probably the most famous, uh, maybe... Number one or number two, the most famous case study in all of psychology, definitely the most famous case study in cognitive psychology is HM, um, who had his hippocampus removed during a surgery to help combat his um, persistent seizure, seizures. And he helped us understand that the hippocampus is where this short-term memory is sort of function is happening. Uh, because when they removed his hippocampus, he no longer had short-term memory. Uh, maybe the most famous example in all of psychology is Phineas Gage, uh, 1846. He's a railroad worker in a horrible accident. This railroad uh, tamping iron is shot through his face and out the top of his skull. Uh, remarkably, he survived, uh, but it basically obliterated his left frontal lobe. And 
it was observed that his personality changed dramatically. He became very mean, very irate, uh, very erratic. Um, and that helped us actually start to formulate ideas about the fact that the frontal lobe has to do with personality, uh, which we know it does today. Uh, another really great recent example, um, this is from an, a newscast in LA. That's the Staples Center back behind her there. It's from a few years ago, I think maybe seven or eight years ago. Um, this uh, reporter actually on air in real time has like a mini stroke. She actually turned out to be perfectly fine. She's okay, no long-term effects. Uh, but this little mini stroke happened in a language portion of her brain and produced in aphasia, which is sort of a general term uh, for a, a problem with language. There's lots of different types of aphasia. Uh, and here we're gonna observe uh, specifically her uh, on-air aphasia. It's a little jarring, uh, it's a little weird. Uh, so I'm gonna play the video twice, but I want you to notice how um, she is able to make the noises of speech and, and she's able to, her facial expressions are fine and her patterns of speech are fine. The rhythm of her speech is fine, but the noises don't, don't relate to each other. It's just gibberish. Um, and so something like this actually helps us learn, in fact, that the, the rhythm and patterns of speech are actually controlled differently or separately from the content of of speech. So let's take a look at this video. And backstage coverage we're seeing for the very first time, Sarid. Well, a very, very heavy, uh, heavy divertation tonight. We had a very Darrison fight. Let's go ahead, Terrace Chase, and let's put the bit to have this hit. Okay, we're going to play that one more time. Backstage coverage we're seeing for the very first time, Sarid. Well, a very, very heavy, uh, heavy divertation tonight. We had a very Darrison fight. Let's go ahead, Terrace Chase, and let's put the Okay, so what we can notice about this is that you can see that at first she doesn't notice that anything is wrong, right? She's just doing her reporter thing and she's got all the mannerisms and all the rhythms and the head nods and stuff. Um, but the noises don't make any sense. What you can tell in a really interesting way is that somewhere in her mind, she has thoughts that she's that are real, right? They're the real reporter thoughts that she's trying to get out. They exist up there in her brain. She's trying to get them out. But somewhere along the way, somewhere along the process from those thoughts existing in her mind to them getting processed and, and out of her mouth, the noises get all jumbled up and it no longer makes sense. She starts to maybe realize it right here at the end. You can see her her expression kind of changes. Um, she tries to sort of hurry up and, and get to the end of her thing uh, and move on. Um, let's let's just watch the very end of it. We had a very Darrison fight. Let's go ahead, Terrace Chase, and let's put the bit to have the pit. Right, so she kind of notices something is wrong. She's trying to like throw it back to the studio. Um, but she still can't produce sounds that make any sense. Um, this is known as an aphasia. And I guess I could have played it here, I guess. There's my little button. Um, maybe I have to get rid of the laser pointer. Hold on. Give me two seconds. I'm going to play with this. All right. So with the arrow, I can do it. With the laser pointer, I can't. Okay. I learned something today. Um, so... This aphasia, um, this this problem with speaking was temporary for her, caused by a little miniature stroke. Um, she was checked out at the hospital, all of her normal language functioning came back, she's fine. But we can use these situations to, to help teach us about cognitive psychology. Okay, so now, lastly, let's turn our attention to sort of the modern ways in which we can collect data directly from the brain or manipulate the brain in order to collect data. We're going to talk about EEG, ERP, then TMS, then PET scans, fMRI, and DTI. So EEG stands for an electroencephalogram. It looks kind of like this, uh, where basically we can measure um, electrical activity through the scalp 
and through the skull. And we can get an idea about at each of these nodes is what they're called, N-O-D-E-S, uh, is recording the electrical activity of a group of neurons or a, a chunk of the brain that's just below it. And so we can get an idea of where activity is occurring in the brain given a particular stimulus or given a particular task. Right? So we could ask this person to read. We could ask this person to do math. We could ask this person to talk. We could ask this person to, to imagine or remember. And we could see what the, uh, where the electrical activity is occurring in their brain. We can also then uh, turn this into ERP, uh, which is essentially EEG over time in a sense. Uh, and so we can stretch out these measurements over time and see um, these sort of patterns of electrical activity uh, in different areas of the brain over time. Uh, next is TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, looks like this little uh, figure eight wand thing here. So basically uses magnets uh, to disrupt brain activity. Uh, and so this can be used to, to essentially turn off areas of the brain so that we can, uh, we can study what they do. Uh, they only turn them off temporarily. Uh, they immediately come back when you stop the, the magnetism. But it essentially allows us to induce basically the effects of a stroke, just like that reporter had live on air. We can go into a piece of the brain and turn it off. And by turning it off, and then we can see what it does, and then we bring it back, and uh, and we can understand the function of that piece of brain. Uh, let's take a look at a video of someone undergoing TMS. Let me get back to my arrow. We start at the back of the brain. We've um, we've switched off my visual cortex, so made me unable to see things. If we move a little bit forward in the brain, we've interfered with people's ability and my ability to see faces. Uh, a little bit further forward, we've uh, interfered with the ability to perform actions. Start moving your finger. <laughs> it's quite odd. It's not your finger anymore. It's not my finger anymore. <laughs> so. Um... Now he kind of jumps here. He's not being shocked, right? You get this little burp and then his, his hand kind of, um, kind of, uh, trembles. Um, he, he's not being hurt. He's not being shocked. Um, it's just, they're interfering with what's known as his motor cortex, the area of the brain that controls, um, uh, bodily movements. Interfered with the ability to, um, compute with numbers. Six. Seven. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yes. We've Sweet. interfered with the ability to uh, to speak. London Bridge, London Bridge, London Bridge is falling down. Uh -oh. uh, you think of something you can do, and we've basically interfered with it with with this machine. Two, three. Um, what's also really cool about TMS is this is out now actually being used as. Um, a therapeutic machine in, in uh, mental health. There's um, some new uh, work over, I think the last five to 10 years showing that very targeted um, targeted um, therapies with TMS in particular areas of the brain with particular mental health issues uh, can actually be therapeutic and be helpful. So uh, let's move on to our next one. Uh, Next, we're gonna talk about um, imaging techniques. So uh, these allow us to see, uh, actually see brain activity. Uh, the first one is a PET scan. PET scans um, detect a radioactive marker. So you basically have people drink this, like, this solution that has a radioactive element in it. It's perfectly safe. There's no danger to it that little radioactive marker attaches itself to your blood cells. Um, and then we can, we can see blood flow anywhere in the body, but of particular interest is the brain by looking for that radioactive marker. So here on the left, we can see the, the, the brighter the color, the more of the radioactive marker in the blood. Um, and the, the darker the color, the less of the radioactive marker is in the blood. We can see on the left, 
normal brain activity. And we can see on the right, the brain of someone with Alzheimer's disease. Notice how there are these areas that are much darker, including here, much darker in the Alzheimer's patient than they are in the neurotypical patient. This cannot be used in real time. Um, we're, you're taking sort of images over time, um, but we can see stretches of time with a PET scan. And we can get an idea for overall brain activity by looking for blood flow. A sort of dramatic jump in imaging technologies was fMRI. fMRI came, came about in the 90s. Um, if you've ever uh, maybe had surgery or um, torn a, a ligament or a tendon or something like that, you've probably had an MRI. MRI stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging. And an MRI gives us a picture sort of of the body beneath the skin. So we can see here, we get these pictures of someone's um, head and brain. This is actually looking down through the top of someone's head. Uh, we can see their eye sockets here. We can see this is their nasal cavity. And then this is their brain. And you can see the, the edge of their skull, for example, right? This would be like their cheekbones, their their um, their facial uh, facial bones. So we're peering down through the skin, through bone, and we're able to see soft tissue in the body. Uh, MRI is used obviously all the time in a medical setting to evaluate uh, damage, to look for tumors, um, all things of that sort. And then we figured out how to add a functional, that's what the F stands for, a functional element where we can detect blood flow and then map that blood flow onto the structural scan of the brain such that um, we can ask someone to do something and then in real time we can see what their brain is doing to deal with that task so here um, the the more yellow the more activity you get um, the more activity there is the more blood flow there is in the brain and we can see that there's lots of activity sort of at the back of the brain right this is someone's eyes so this is the back of their brain uh, so this person is probably watching something. They're watching uh, or looking at an image or watching a video because this is what's known as the occipital lobe, which is where your visual cortex is. And lastly, our last slide of the day uh, or of the chapter uh, is DTI, diffusion tensor imaging. Uh, and this is how we look at connections in the brain. So fMRI, oops, sorry about that. fMRI looks at um, physical pictures of the brain and where activity is occurring at any given moment. DTI looks at connections in the brain. So each of these strands is a connection between one part of the brain and another part of the brain. And the colors tell us the direction of that connection of those connections is so is the information flowing from top to bottom or is the information flowing from bottom to top the information flowing from left to right or right to left and then the intensity of that information uh, is also seen in the colors and so we can get this amazing giant global picture of not just the our ability to as with an fmri localize functions to particular areas of the brain. But we can start to ask questions about, well, if this area of the brain over here does task X and this area of the brain over here does task Y, do they talk to each other, right? Do they coordinate their activity somehow um, to produce this sort of larger global phenomena of behavior and cognitions? And so this is really the, the, the most up-to-date, the most um, cutting-edge uh, brain imaging technologies that we have in, in medicine and in um, psychology, particularly cognitive psychology, cognitive neuroscience, and neuroscience. Well, that's it for Chapter 1, an introduction to, to cognitive psychology. I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, make sure you... Uh, take a look. Oh, I forgot to mention there's this little video down here. If you want to take a look at that, it's it's um, a cool video of a doctor going through and looking at a, a, 
a brain tumor and how that brain tumor is impacting um, both um, localized functions with fMRI as well as connections with DTI. So take a look at that if you're interested, just copy paste that link. Um, head on back. Uh, and as I said before, uh, you can always uh, look at these static PowerPoints again if you need to, as well as replay this video uh, as many times as possible. Uh, hope you enjoyed chapter one. Be on the lookout for chapter two as well, where we will dive a little bit more into uh, the brain, its, its pieces, its parts, uh, what each of those parts does, its functions, uh, as well as get into a little bit um, in, about uh, breaking down the brain into uh, neurons and neural connections and what that means for the, the field of cognitive psychology. So thanks, everyone, and I will talk to you later.